Hi, I'm Lance Lambert. Thanks for tuning in to the Vintage Vehicle Show. We are in Long Beach, California at the Bob Fanari Collection. This is a really neat collection and it's a little bit different. We didn't even plan on shooting this collection and we were nearby doing another shoot. I was invited to take a look at this collection and it blew me away. It just was a real special surprise. So Bob Fanari, come on in here and thank you for that special surprise. <laughs> You're very welcome, this Lance. This is great. Tell us about this. Uh, well, this is a collection that started back in 1985. Um, it's a reflection of my own particular tastes in automobiles, uh, which tend to center around styling and performance. So you have a combination here of older cars uh, that I grew up with back in the 60s and 70s, and then more contemporary automobiles that uh, I have found particularly attractive or appealing to put in the collection. Now, a lot of you, about half your collection is what we would normally have on most of our episodes, and the other half are things we wouldn't normally feature, but I was so taken with them that they, uh, there's some pretty special stuff there. There's one car here. We're going to kind of start different than we normally do. Okay. It's a much newer car than we would feature on the show, but it is breathtaking. And any car called a Piranha needs a little extra attention. So let's take a look at the Piranha. Let's do that. Bob, we never feature 2012 cars on the show, <laughs> on the vintage vehicle show, but boy, this thing just leapt out at me when I walked in the building. What, what do we have here? What we have is a, a very unique automobile. Um, I first became aware of it uh, when somebody sent me an email with a rendering uh, of what this automobile was going to look like when it was going to be built. Uh, it was built in South Africa by High Tech Manufacturing, the same people that build the Super Performance uh, Cobra Reproductions. A group of investors got together and decided they wanted to build a supercar. So they went to Italy and they engaged the Zagato coach people in Milan to build them a unique design, which is what this car is. It's essentially a, a clean sheet of paper design. And then Lee Noble in England, uh, who builds the Noble supercars, did the chassis on this automobile. The car was sold without drivetrain, brought into the U.S., and then each owner could pick a drivetrain to suit their particular needs. In my case, uh, Brian Thompson up in Wixom, Michigan, built the motor for this car. It's the nearest thing to a full race streetable motor, I guess, that, uh, that he builds. It's a 700 horsepower uh, LS7 stroker. So this car is uh, not only looks mean and aggressive, but when you fire it up, uh, it definitely gets your attention. Is it carbon fiber or? It is the same material that the uh, Corvettes have used traditionally in, uh, in uh, their bodies. So it's uh, not aluminum, it's not steel, it's, it's a composite body. What kind of reaction do you get from people? <laughs> Uh, people are blown away when they see this car. They, they've never seen anything quite like it. Uh, a lot of people aren't sure what it is. Uh, they just know that it looks neat. Uh, so they come up and they ask, well, what's a piranha? And I explain to them pretty much the same story that I just told you in terms of how this car came into being. And any of the viewers that go online, it's not spelled like the fish. It's, no, it's, it's not. <laughs> P-E-R. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, a very unique automobile, uh, probably 50 of these in the whole world, uh, and maybe 12 to 15 of them in the U.S. Are they still building them? They're building uh, a car that's very similar to this. Uh, the Piranha Group that started the car, uh, or started the project for the car, actually went uh, into financial difficulty and they sold the design to AC Cars in England. So AC Cars is continuing to make a car that looks very similar to this, but with their brand on it and with a uh, Corvette base uh, LS motor in it. AC seems to end up with some interesting things in their lap. They, they do indeed, and yeah, they do indeed. Uh, well, you have something around the corner here that's a little more traditional when it comes to a, a powerful car. Let's take a look at that. Absolutely. The vintage vehicle show viewers, when they think of power, they think more of this rather than the prawn that we looked at. This yes. is a real kind of beat on your chest. Yeah, I'm going to go fast. <laughs> it absolutely is. Uh, this is the very first car that we put in the collection. Uh, it's been with me since 1985. It's a 1967 uh, Corvette. Uh, came with the original 435 horse <clears throat> tri-power motor. Today it um, contains a 541 cubic inch all aluminum big block Chevy that puts out about 750 horsepower. So a substantial uh, increase from what the car originally came with. We took the step of adding uh, aftermarket brakes, uh, a better cooling system, different transmission to make sure that the car would be drivable and capable of handling the horsepower that it puts out. 
Do you get any argument from the purists on the changes? There are people who would uh, tell me that what I've done to the car is, is essentially uh, depreciated it as a result of what I've uh, done in the way of enhancements. My own view is that these cars are meant to be driven, and if you're going to drive them, uh, why not enhance them Enjoy. to make them more drivable and to build on the theme of horsepower and performance, which is what this car really was all about when it was brought to the market in 1967. Mm -hmm. Your wife, Pam, is a real active part of this collection and your automotive life. What she think about this car? <laughs> this is the uh, very first car that uh, she actually rode in uh, when uh, we, we, before we were married. Uh, I took her to lunch uh, in this automobile, and it was a very hot day, I recall, and she claimed that she was melting over uh -huh. there in the uh, passenger seat as we, uh, as we went to the restaurant. Uh, since then, we've put air conditioning in this car so she no longer melts when we're, we're traveling in it. Did you have to do the air conditioning to get her to marry you? Was that part of the negotiation? <laughs> no, that, that came after the fact. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So Good. we managed to, to get married before the air conditioning got into the car. Mm -hmm. uh, next to it is a marriage of uh, performance and beauty and a real traditional look for exotic high-performance cars. Let's take a look at the Cobra over here. Okay. The Cobras, they just have not lost their appeal as far as the design of them. They're, they're gorgeous the day they rolled out of the factory with Carroll Shelby behind the wheel, and they're gorgeous now. Tell us about this one. Well, this, first of all, is, is a reproduction. It's not an original Cobra. Uh, it was built out of an ERA uh, kit. Uh, but uh, Carroll Shelby has signed this automobile, uh, one of the few replicas that he actually uh, was, was prepared to sign. And the reason that he signed it uh, really has to do with the motor that's in this car. Uh, this particular Cobra has what uh, Ford called uh, the Ford Hemi, or the single overhead cam uh, big block uh, engine. 300 of these were built back in the 60s, principally for drag racing. Uh, it was. Uh, originally thought that the engine could uh, be used in NASCAR. Uh, the folks at NASCAR outlawed the engine as basically being an unfair competitive advantage. So the engines got used in, in drag strip uh, automobiles. Uh, we found uh, this particular motor in a shop. It's an old aluminum uh, single overhead cam motor with 58 millimeter Weber carburation on it, uh, which is very unique. And I think it was the amount of engineering that went into this car to make it all come together that was appealing uh, to Carol when he was sitting over in the passenger seat talking with me about the car. And totally uh, unsolicited by me, uh, he reached into his pocket, pulls out a silver Sharpie and scrawls his name across the dashboard and I'm going, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> And I thought, I said, well, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Uh -huh. And so uh, to this day, you can, uh, can clearly see that uh, he put a, a big uh, signature on that dashboard. Okay, probably before I leave, I'll write my name right over his. Would that be okay? <laughs> well, we might want to think about yeah, we'll, that. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. Well, uh, there's another Corvette down the line that's uh, a little different than the one we looked at previously. Let's go take a look at it. Very good. A C3 Corvette. Um, back end here, you widen it out a little bit. That's an uh, indication that something's going on in, under that hood. Tell us about this car. Well, we found this car uh, up in Woodland Hills uh, on, for sale. Uh, it was a you know, reasonably used automobile. Uh, I am a fan of the third generation uh, Corvettes. Uh, growing up, uh, when I got out of college, this was a, what everybody wanted to have, was, was one of these cars. So uh, after a long period of time, I finally came back and realized my dream. Uh, we did a complete frame off restoration on this car. So we pulled the body off, a complete re redo of the chassis, which has been powder coated. And then as I thought about engines uh, to, to put in it, uh, it originally came with a 350 small block uh, V8. I thought, let's go back and, and see if we can't build this into something a little more consistent with what's in our collection. So uh, General Motors uh, at the time was just starting to sell the LSX 454 crate motor, which was a huge bargain. Uh, you could buy 600 horsepower for $9,500 right from the factory. So we did that, uh, bought the crate motor, and then put a different transmission, uh, reinforced the back end with bigger half shafts, again, aftermarket brakes. So this is a 600 horsepower, uh, 1973 Corvette. And performance-wise, it's very close to a ZR1. So it's, uh, again, very traditional looking uh, styling, uh, but a lot of uh, performance. 
The C3 that we're referring to, that's 68 to 82, right? Corvettes? That's correct. And a real unique, uh, distinctive body style that seems to be kind of a love it or hate it body <laughs> style. And, and you and I, I, I had a 78. I love this body style. I think it's, it's re very aggressive. And yeah. I, I do as well, Lance. I, uh, I, again, uh, these cars were very much in vogue when I got out of college and uh, I, I investigated actually buying one of these cars uh, when I was living in Cleveland, Ohio. And the insurance for a 21-year-old <laughs> on this car uh, was almost half of what the car was worth. Right. And I could afford the car, but I couldn't afford the insurance. Mm -hmm. So it had to, it had to go into, uh, into the future, and, and here it is today. To many people within the hobby and outside of the hobby, consider this body design to be the most beautiful car ever manufactured. Tell us about this E-Type Jag. Well, the E-Type e uh, joined the collection about 10 years ago. Uh, I had always wanted one of these automobiles. Uh, to your point, I think they are one of the most beautiful designs ever done. Uh, the story is that when this was introduced at the Geneva Auto Show in 1961, Enzo Ferrari was in the audience when they unveiled this car. He took one look and said, it's the most beautiful automobile he'd ever seen. He also realized that performance-wise, this was better than anything he was producing uh -oh. back in Marinello, and he had to go back and uh, essentially up his game. Uh, not only is the car beautiful, uh, but performance-wise, it was just a, a breakthrough automobile. Uh, Four-wheel independent suspension, overhead cam engine, 150 miles an hour right out of the factory. They just didn't build cars like this back in 1961. And when you look at it today, uh, it certainly doesn't look like a 50-year-old automobile. Right. It looks very contemporary. British Racing Green, Fawn Interior. You nailed it. It's just <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we tried to keep this car pretty close uh, to its original factory condition. Uh, it's got Weber carburation, tubular headers, and a little more aggressive cams on the motor. But for the most part, uh, it, it is pretty much the way it came from the factory. When you're out in this car, of course you're getting a uh, thumbs up from every car lover that you see, but do you have, you know, does the, the elderly gentleman pushing the shopping cart uh, buy you at the store? What, do, what kind of reaction do you get from people? People, people love seeing this car out uh, on the highway. And, and to your point, you know, we get a lot of uh, very positive uh, signals from people who are driving uh, next to us or who are passing us on the highway. Uh, th this car is just um, just an iconic automobile and probably one of the easiest uh, automobiles to drive. It's been reliable, uh, we've taken it on long trips without any problems, so it just, it's just a great all-around automobile. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, uh, we've visited England, let's go to Italy now. <laughs> okay. I know very little about Alfa Romeos other than they're very cool cars, so whatever you say is going to be all new information to me. Tell me about this car. Fair enough. This is a uh, 1972 Alfa uh, GTV 2000. Uh, this is an automobile that was actually pretty competitive in D-type uh, SCCA racing uh, back in the era when it was contemporary. Uh, we bought this car at auction. Um, literally, it was a whimsical purchase. I saw the car in the catalog and took a look and said, wow, that's just kind of a neat looking little automobile. So we put it in the collection and I will tell you that even though it is probably, you know, the weakest from a horsepower standpoint of any car we've got in the collection, it is probably the most fun to drive. There's something magic about the way Alphas talk to you uh, when you're out on the highway driving them, handling, braking, is a, just a completely different sensation. The fact that it's a small package, uh, very nimble, uh, very easy to, to toss about, uh, is part of the appeal, I think, of uh, something like this car. So uh, even though it's what I would call the runt of our litter, uh, it is just a very neat automobile to, uh, to drive. When these were brand new, this particular uh, style, were they going for the young Italian businessman or who, who are business person? Who are they? Who is the market? The, the, the market really was the same people that would buy a BMW 2000, uh, 2012. Uh, it was the people who were looking for a sports sedan uh, that was, you know, had had four seats in it, 
but had a sporty uh, feel to it. So it was for people who wanted to kind of have a little practicality, but, but a sporty feel at the same time. So the, the husband or wife could come home and say, oh, look what I bought, and we can put the kids in the back. Absolutely. <laughs> it's that uh, wonderful justification for, uh, for buying a car like this, that it's practical, but sporty. Uh, Alfa Romeos, and, and here I'm, I'm fishing, I, I think I might have this right, they were undervalued for a long time, and then all of a sudden people woke up, and now they're getting pretty good money for these. They, they are starting to get recognition. Uh, you know, Alphas were, were tremendously competitive race cars uh, back in the 30s and 40s, uh, and and unfortunately, you know, the, the mark suffered from some quality issues uh, back in its history, but they are definitely coming back, and you see it in the Alpha 8C and the Alpha 4C, which are beautiful, just beautiful, striking automobiles. So I think Alphas are definitely on their way back, and, and cars like this are getting much more appreciation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Maseratis? Ah, <laughs> a whole nother story. <laughs> All right, well, we have another story here for you. Your 69 Maserati is breathtakingly gorgeous, but it also holds a little secret. So. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, the Maseratis, a little history on the car itself. The, the Maseratis were contemporary. This particular Maserati, the Ghibli, was contemporary with the Ferrari Daytona back in the late 60s and early 70s. They sold for about the same amount of money and people who uh, were in the market for buying a high-performance grand touring car would, would consider either one uh, to be a legitimate option. Since then, uh, the fortunes of Ferraris and Maseratis have gone in different directions. And for years, Ferraris have appreciated in value. Daytonas are worth a considerable amount of money today. The Ghiblis uh, really haven't done much. In fact, they've, they've kind of depreciated over time. Uh, that's beginning to turn around as Maserati has come back into the U.S. with, with better product, but for a long time, uh, these cars really didn't get much love. Uh, this particular car uh, we found in Houston, Texas. It was, uh, when we acquired it, it was robin egg blue with a red leather interior, so it was a, not a particularly appealing color scheme. We redid the car uh, in the uh, colors that you see here and brought it back to concourse condition and then drove it for, for a few years. And then, um, typical of what I have in my collection, I decided it could use more horsepower. So this Maserati today uh, has a Corvette LT5 uh, motor designed by Lotus uh, for General Motors. Uh, probably only 2,000 of those motors uh, built uh, over a four or five year time span. And then the rest of the uh, Corvette drivetrain was uh, essentially used to replace what was in the Ghibli. When you look at the car, it's hard to tell it uh, apart from a regular Ghibli, uh, but it very definitely has a different performance, level of performance uh, than the original Ghiblis. The, uh, the legend on these cars, which is interesting, is that Henry Ford was one of the first two buyers of the uh, Ghibli back in 1967. And when he bought his car, he parked it outside the styling studios in Dearborn so that his stylist would have to go buy this car every single day and look at what good design uh, was all about. So a little GT40 inspiration here yeah. maybe? Well, I think he was just uh, enamored by the lines. The uh, Giorgio did such a wonderful job in, in, in designing this car and he wanted his stylist to understand that uh, there were such things as, as people who could do uh, really great designs mm -hmm. and, and wanted them to be inspired uh, by what they saw. The recognition, uh, what kind of recognition do you get on the motor when they see the, the Maserati <laughs> parts and pieces on there? People are a little puzzled. People who are not uh, familiar with the mark uh, look at it and say, hmm, there's something about that that isn't quite right, uh, but I'm not quite sure what. Uh, there are people who understand these automobiles and who perhaps even collect these automobiles who clearly understand that something was done here uh, that is non-traditional, mm -hmm. uh, non-factory correct.
So I was, I was given Ferrari just a little bit of a bad time uh, with the comparison to uh, Maserati, but they're spectacular cars. This is a, a 2000 Marinello, is that it right? Is, it is a 2000 550 Marinello. It's the uh, first Ferrari in our collection. Uh, growing up, I think everybody, every, every young man, uh, lusts after having a Ferrari, a Ferrari ownership experience. And for me, that came about in uh, 2007. So this was a car that we found uh, on consignment, uh, seven years old, and it had 5,000 miles on it when we acquired it. I've driven one Ferrari in my life, and uh, I wrote a story in my book about the experience of being in a 99 Marinello that uh, Dick Marconi had. And I've, I got it. At that point, it's like, oh, that's what this is all about. That thing was a real performer. Th these, are, these are wonderful automobiles. Uh, there's something unique about uh, V12 Ferraris uh, in the way that they handle, the way that the uh, engines uh, rev when you get into them. Uh, this has been a remarkably reliable automobile. Again, we've taken it on long trips. Uh, Derek Bell, who, uh, who raced uh, competitively uh, and very successfully, actually has one of these cars in his own personal collection in England. Uh, Phil Hill, uh, who is uh, the first Formula One championship for the U.S., called this car the best grand touring car Ferrari ever built. Mm. So it is clearly a, a remarkable automobile and we're very pleased to have it in our collection. When Dick and I took his for a run, I was driving and he kept getting after me to get on it. And when I finally followed the instructions, my stomach flipped, my eyes went back in the, their sockets. It was, the acceleration was really impressive. Yeah. And I just dropped down and took off, just straight as an arrow. Yep, no, the, the, these cars are, are very, very well engineered. And and um, you know they, they perform incredibly well, uh, but they're relatively easy to drive at the same time. Now, you can drive this car in traffic in Los Angeles and not worry about it overheating, not worry about uh, you know it, it being uh, finicky uh, or unreliable. It's just a wonderful car. Mm -hmm. It is. It's beautiful. 1969 Camaro. If you're going to have a Camaro, that's the one to own. People love these automobiles. Uh, this particular uh, automobile, the Z28, uh, was raced uh, competitively back in the late 60s in the Trans Am series. So Ford, uh, Chevrolet, Chrysler, even American Motors uh, with the Javelin uh, were competitive in Trans Am racing. And it was a little bit of the race on Sunday, sell on Monday uh, thinking behind these automobiles. Uh, this particular car uh, is actually the, one of the few Concours uh, absolute 100 point correct automobiles that we have in the collection. Uh, it's a very striking color combination as you can see, uh, but it is basically 1969 technology and when you get out and drive it, uh, you realize what a difference uh, the last 50 years has made in terms of uh, automobiles and, and uh, their drivability and their ability to handle, brake, uh, and even accelerate. The Trans Am uh, regulations were a five liter maximum on engine displacement. So this is a small block Chevy, uh, 302 cubic inches, but it has a very aggressive cam, uh, a big Holley four barrel uh, on it. And although the engines were rated at 295 horsepower from the factory, there are people who will tell you that these motors were really closer to 400 uh, horsepower back in 1969. And certainly when people like Roger Penske and others who, who tuned these cars for racing uh, got into them, uh, they were every bit of that uh, level of performance. Mm -hmm. Well, your collection here is every bit of, of levels of performance <laughs> and beauty. What a, what a great looking collection. I want to thank you for bringing us into your collection here. You're it's most welcome. just absolutely incredible. So thank you very much for being on the Vintage Vehicle Show. You're very welcome. All right. And thank you very much. As I tell you often, if you're not watching the show, we don't have a show. So we appreciate it very much. And until we see you again, bye. Bye-bye.